to, to let Susan pop up. Perfect. Thanks, Emma. Okay. Welcome to those in the attend in attendance at today's remote meeting of the local review body, Aberdeen City Council, on Thursday, the 25th of March. Please note the meeting will be recorded and published online for public access of the meeting. Can all members keep their cameras on but mute their microphones when not speaking? Officers should have their cameras and microphones switched off unless they're invited to speak. I will now ask the clerk to undertake a roll call for members' participation today and for all members to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced so that it's clear in the recording of the meeting. As the local review body contains quasi judicial business, members are reminded that they should not leave the room or meeting during consideration of any of the reviews. The meeting has been uh, convened in response, actually, I'll ask, yeah, sorry, um, in response to a request for review of the decision taken by the appointed officer under the council scheme of delegation. Members of the local review body have before them copies of the review documents listed in the notice following the meeting. We will now ask Mr. Masson, the assistant clerk, to outline the procedures to be followed today prior to him taking a roll call. It makes it happen. Okay, so I'll do the roll call first. Councillor Bolton, chairperson? Here. Councillor Bell? Present. And Councillor McKenzie? Here. Thank you. Okay, members have the procedure note which was circulated with the meeting papers and is intended as intended to set out the wider framework within which the review process operates. From this, it is clear that the first task for the review body is to come to a decision on whether the review documents contain sufficient information for the case to be determined without further procedure. And by that, it is meant without further information or representations. To assist, I feel it would be helpful to mention the following. Firstly, that the regulations governing the local review process require that all matters which the applicant intends to raise in the review must be set out in or accompany the notice of review. Secondly, that the focus of the review should be on the basis of what was before the appointed officer when a decision was made and only in exceptional circumstances will new or additional matters be permitted to be taken into account. Thirdly, to note that the modernisation of the planning system, which included revisal of the planning appeals process, of which this local review body is part, removed the process right on the part of an applicant to insist on a hearing and replaced that with a local review body, providing them with the power to choose a procedure which more accurately reflects the facts and circumstances of the individual case. And lastly, that guidance issued by the Scottish Government's Chief Planner in 2011 stated that reviews by local review bodies should be conducted by means of full consideration of the application afresh. This review should take the form of a structured discussion led by the chairperson to consider the matter set out in the notice of review before you, and I would conclude by drawing your attention in particular to points 10 to 12 of the procedure note. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Masson. Um, if I could just on agenda on the, onto the agenda, if I could just confirm both um, procedure note from page three to four. Um, now turning to consideration of the review in respect of the decision to diffuse the application for detailed planning permission for the erection of a single story pension to the side and formation of a carport garden room gym at the high at Highfield Brownstone Road planning reference number. 200265-DPP. You will recall that this review was deferred from the local review body meeting on the 10th of February 2021 in order to allow an agricultural special, specialist to be in attendance for a response to questions from member on three matters. But with regard to this, Mr. Richard Burr is here with us today. We will now hear from the planning advisor in attendance, Mr. Gavin Evans who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal and a reminder of the reasons why the application was refused. I would point out that Mr Evan attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary professional planning guidance because he has not been involved in the earlier consideration of the application under review. Mr Evans will not, however, be asked to express any views of, on the merits of proposed development and in effect his role in will be one of neutral, and indeed the role of Mr. Brough will be a neutral one, providing factual information. Um, if I could now just hand over to Mr. Evans. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll just get my presentation up on screen here. Um, 
There we are. Hopefully everyone can see that OK. Um, so yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as you said before, as we have a request for review um, against the appointed officer's decision to refuse planning permission under delegated powers for the erection of a single storey extension to the side and formation of a carport and garden room slash gym at the Highfield Borrowstone Road. Um, the review was submitted with all the necessary information and within the time limit of three months following the appointed officer's decision. Um, in terms of new matters, uh, when the local review body previously met, um, that matter was, was addressed and members expressed satisfaction that um, additional correspondence between the applicants and Transport Scotland uh, post-determination would be accepted and also that an updated site plan um, be accepted on the basis that it was correcting a, a discrepancy between the tree submissions and the, the site plan. Um, so just quickly with uh, site description, um, I'm afraid this will all seem uh, somewhat familiar, but it's been a number of weeks since we last met, so probably best to go through it again. Um, so the application property is located uh, approximately 70 metres to the west of the AWPR, roughly 500 metres north of the Kingswell South AWPR junction. The site's located in a rural area which forms part of the designated green belt and green space network designations in the Aberdeen Local Development Plan. To the north is the Three Hills Local Nature Conservation Site. Um, whilst the surrounding area is largely open countryside, there are two further dwellings located uh, roughly 50 metres to the south at West Hatton and the Bothy, beyond which lie agricultural fields. The site is accessed via a private road which is shared with these other properties and that leads to the property's own driveway. Uh, to the west of the site lie further agricultural fields and there are mature trees along the north and west boundaries of the site which are um, just shown on that GIS image there and then better shown from the aerial, uh, aerial photograph there. Uh, the existing property at the high field comprises a detached bungalow uh, with detached double garage uh, this, this being an image of the garage there, uh, set in the northeast, uh, sorry, the eastern corner of a large residential plot which exceeds half a hectare. Both the dwelling and garage are of relatively, sorry, modern design, finished in render and fife stone with a red tiled roof. The dwelling has been previously extended with a conservatory added to the south elevation. Um, this is just a photo showing the location of work, so the extension would be coming off the gable wall here. And then the extension to the garage to form the carport is on the on the far side of the garage there. So this is just a site plan as existing and as proposed. Um, in terms of planning history, the officer's report noted no relevant planning history to the, uh, to the site. Um, turning to the proposal then, uh, the application proposes a single storey extension to the northern or side elevation of the property, um, which you can just see in this, this portion of the image here, uh, as well as the construction of a new garden room slash gym and double width carport, which is affixed to the existing double garage. So this is the existing double garage in the existing plan. And then what we'd have is the gym come garden room on the far side and then linking those two uh, areas of internal space is a, is a double sized carport. This is just elevations showing the uh, the extension to the house, so you can see it coming off the gable wall there. Uh, note of the materials there, um, essentially all just to match the style and the materials of the existing property. <clears throat> That's the rear view, um, so there's a there's a bay window incorporated on the front, and um, with fife stone um, at, at the at bay window. And then the rear elevation, that's just a uh, rough cast or dry dash uh, with red concrete roof tiles. It's a side elevation there showing the, the newly formed gable with the um, bay window projecting at the front. And then uh, from the other side, uh, so nothing changing. This is the existing conservatory. Um, so that, that side of the house is unchanged, but then in the background you can see the introduction of the uh, the carport linking the existing garage with the new garden room come gym. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this is the elevations of the garage. Again, materials uh, largely to match the existing uh, existing building there, uh, with the introduction of vertical larch linings as well on this front elevation. 
uh, that's just the rear view again large linings on on that portion and um, the general form and, and uh, roof shape and roof height and things like that all to match the existing structure um, side view no change in that elevation um, so in the lower image here this is the introduction of the the garden room which has full height glazing and um, large linings and and as i said roof style to match the existing property <clears throat> so uh sorry i was just sort of talking away from my notes for a second there um da, 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 so just gone through the visuals so um we then have the existing and proposed ground floor uh, plans so you can see how that changes if i flick just back and forth between the two so the uh, the extension coming out off that end of the building and then the extension to the garage down there um, and this is the northern boundary where the <coughs> the trees that the appointed officer concluded would be affected by the proposal are located um, just some 3d visualizations as well to give you an indication um, so again just various angles of the same the same image really and um, so showing the extension to the garage there and then the extension to the house from that point onwards that's just zoomed in versions of the same can come back to any of these um should you wish um so in terms of the arboricultural submissions um this is just a, an extract from the tree survey uh, notable points being that there are a mix of category a b and c specimens uh, all of which are beech trees um, which range between 12 and 20 meters in height um, no trees are proposed for removal um, to directly facilitate the development um, and no trees were recommended for removal on the grounds of their their health or condition um, at the survey plan just here uh, you note the position of trees relative to the existing property um, so all of the trees lie out with the site boundary but they are very close to it and very close to the existing uh, existing buildings um, the green circles here are the category a trees uh, blue category b and grey category c now the wider green circles indicate indicate the extent of the tree canopy and the blue circles uh, indicate root protection area so that's the the area with when within which the uh, root system of the tree might be affected by excavation or uh, or storage of materials uh, you know particularly heavy materials above ground <clears throat> on the third image here the arboricultural impact plan uh, you'll note the introduction of an additional circle the orange ones here which is much wider uh, these orange rings reflect a, a theoretical area within which trees may be affected uh, indirectly by development as a result of their proximity to uh, to buildings where they can be perceived as a threat for example and that can lead to pressure for their removal uh, in later years uh, pink shaded areas just in here and in here show the extent of encroachment within root protection areas of trees however you'll note that the encroachment in terms of zone of influence is, is much greater with that being a much wider area um, root systems can also be affected by construction activity around the trees and um, not just the footprint of the building itself and on that front uh, this fourth image shows the use of a cellular confinement system um, shown in the, the orange color here which was intended to reduce the impact of construction activities by spreading the the load of vehicles or machinery um, relating to construction activity around the, the footprint of the building itself um, and that being porous so that roots still get more moisture um, along with the pink line which you can just see here hopefully um, which sets out where tree protection fencing would be erected to prevent construction vehicles or activity getting any closer to trees and uh, and further affecting canopies or root protection areas. Um, so just turning to the appointed officers uh, reasons for refusal. Um, firstly, the proposal was seen as resulting in significant impact on the root protection area of five mature beech trees, um, all of which lie out with the application site in different ownership. Um, these would also result in significant encroachment within the zone of influence of seven mature beech trees, um, again, all of which are out with the, uh, the site in different ownership. Um, we, we established at the previous meeting that the word further in the decision notice was erroneous. So um, 
essentially we're talking about five trees being affected in terms of their root protection area and their zone of influence, and two which are affected only uh, in terms of their zone of influence, their root protection area would not be affected. Um, it was also concluded the proposal would be contrary to policy any five relating to trees and woodlands of local development plan and its associated trees and woodlands supplementary guidance. Um, the appointed officer highlighted a conflict with the corresponding policies of the emerging proposed local development plan and ultimately came to the view that there were no material considerations that would want, warrant approval of the application um, in the context of those policy conflicts. Uh, there were a number of questions from members at the, the last review body meeting um, on the, the purpose of the cellular confinement system um, and both during and after construction and also the protection of property uh, in the longer term. Um, so I think Mr Brock is perhaps best able to, to field those questions and thanks to him for attending today. Um, in terms of the appellant's case, uh, the appellant submitted a statement in support of the application which is available in the agenda pack and main points as follows. Uh, firstly, highlights that the appeal turns on the conflict with one policy, uh, that being any five trees and woodlands. And the reasons for refusal doesn't say specifically what is unacceptable about the proposal in terms of the information which was provided uh, to aid the assessment. Um, contends that there's no conflict with any five in the applicant's view or the associated supplementary guidance as it impacts on the root protection areas and zone of influence have been adequately addressed and mitigations proposed. Um, the house, garage and part of the garden area are already located within the root protection area and zone of influence of some of these trees. Um, the trees haven't been adversely affected by that and the proposed extensions, excuse me, would not have a considerable or significant uh, impact on the trees over and above that. Uh, also, there is no alternative location to uh, accommodate the required extensions on the ground floor of the property. The layout, siting and design of the proposal is otherwise as uh, otherwise acceptable as is the development from all other respects. Uh, Transport Scotland have advised that the trees are not a safety concern and there's no need for their removal as a result of the proposed development. Transport Scotland would ultimately be responsible for monitoring um, and ongoing management and maintenance of, the, of those trees in their ownership. Um, also highlights that the City Council's inflexible approach to development within root protection areas or zone of influence of trees is in the applicant's view inconsistent with the relevant British standard and in their view insufficient regard has been given to the proposed mitigation put forward. In terms of uh, consultations and uh, representations, there was no response from the local Kingswells Community Council and uh, nor were there any uh, objections or, or letters in support from members of the public. Um, the applicant had expressed their view that uh, the review may proceed without further procedure being required. Um, I believe that was considered at the last meeting and members were satisfied that no further, uh, no further action was required in that, that front. Um, so normally I would hand back to you there, convener, but I'll just carry on um, if that's OK with the, the policy considerations. Um, so firstly, in terms of the local development plan, as I mentioned, the site lies within the green space network uh, covered by policy NE1. Within uh, that area, policy NE1 requires that the City Council will protect, promote and enhance the landscape value of the green space network and proposals that are likely to destroy or erode the character or function of the green space network will not be permitted. Development which has a negative impact on existing features of value to natural heritage, open space, landscape and recreation should be mitigated through enhancement of the green space network. Um, in this uh, case, we're also located within the green belt. Uh, policy NE2 applying. Uh, this sets out the development will not be permitted in Greenbelt areas unless essential for specified purposes, those being agriculture, woodland, forestry, and so on and so forth, just in that list there. Um, continues to then set out a number of exceptions to that general restriction, uh, just on this next slide. The first of which provides for small scale expansion of existing uses in the Greenbelt. In this case, the existing residential use, the re existing residential property is established and it's for members to consider whether you feel 
this represents a small scale expansion of that existing use, bearing in mind that it's a single dwelling house occupied by you know, people living as a single family, so that wouldn't change. There's no subdivision involved. Policy NE2 also requires that development in Greenbelt areas is of the highest quality in terms of siting, scale, design and materials. Policy NE5 relating to trees and woodlands um, sets out a general presumption against development that would result in the loss of or damage to trees and woodlands, which contribute to nature conservation, landscape character, local amenity or climate change adaptation and mitigation. Yeah. Buildings and services should be sited so as to minimise adverse impacts on existing and future trees. And measures should be taken for the protection and long term management of exist existing trees and new planting both during and after construction. Uh, applications affecting trees are required to include details of tree protection measures, compensatory planting, other details. Policy NE8 uh, relates to natural heritage and sets out the need for appropriate ecological surveys where development may affect protected species and other environmental designations. In this case, the applicants provided a bat survey which concluded that existing buildings did not provide opportunities for roosting and no roosting activity was identified by the survey. Uh, the officer in uh, their report concluded that the proposal would comply with policy NE8. Um, next is policy D1, quality placemaking by design. Uh, this requires development to be of a high standard of design, which demonstrates an understanding of its context and links to the, the six qualities listed here. Um, and then over and above those policies, there's also a relevant supplementary guidance contained within the Householder Development Guide, which has specific sections relating to uh, outbuildings and also sets some general principles for all domestic development. So turning to those general principles, uh, extensions should be architecturally compatible with the original house in the surrounding area in terms of design, scale, materials, etc. It should not dominate or overwhelm the original house and uh, should remain visually subservient to it. So there's a judgment there for members about the scale and uh, sort of sympathetic nature of the extension here. Extension should not result in a situation where the amenity of neighbouring properties would be adversely affected in terms of loss of, for example, daylight, privacy or general amenity. Um, as, as we saw from the, the aerial view in the slides, the, the nearest property is, is around about 50 metres away, so that's uh, something to bear in mind. Um, approvals predating this guidance don't represent a precedent in future decision making and no more than 50% of the front or rear curtilage should be covered by development. Um, there's no conflict in, in that regard because, as we saw, the site is quite extensive, um, so there's no issue with site coverage. Um, the maximum size of extensions to detached dwellings is not specified, and it, uh, the guidance states that these will be assessed on individual merits just based on the local context. Uh, in terms of the specific guidance on outbuildings, um, this sets out that outbuildings must always be subordinate in scale to the dwelling house and two-storey outbuildings will, will generally not be permitted. Uh, everything in this uh, application is taking place at ground floor level. There's no upper floor accommodation. Um, where, a single, where a second storey is to be accommodated, um, I'll just ignore that because uh, it's, it's not applicable in this case, um, as is the commentary on access to upper floors. Uh, outbuildings should not have a negative impact on the character of the surrounding area. So as we've heard, this uh, sites located in the green belt with sort of um, landscape to, to reflect that. Uh, where highly visible and especially in conservation areas, detached garages should be of a scale and design that respects the prevalent context of the surrounding area. Uh, proposals will be assessed on their impact on the amenity of the area, for example, loss of privacy or daylight in the same way as extensions would be. And outbuildings will not usually be acceptable in front gardens because of the damaging effect development forward of a, a front building line can have on the visual character of an area. In this case, because the property sits in isolation effectively, there is no formal building line there. So, um, you know, the, the extent to which that's significant is perhaps much reduced. Um, in terms of just, uh, oh, sorry. I, Missed a, missed a bit there, sorry, skipped on. Um, in terms of the trees and woodland supplementary guidance, 
this sets out that trees within 15 metres of a site boundary, so not necessarily within an application site, must also be shown on plans for householder applications and tree surveys by qualified professionals will be required to accompany those. Uh, it explains the concept of root protection areas within which encroachment should generally be avoided if trees are to be retained and the use of protection fencing to avoid damage to root systems during construction. Also explains the principle of zone of influence in assessing future threat to trees uh, due to proximity of new development or new proposed development. Um, so in terms of uh, decision making then, just a few points to, to consider in members assessment. Uh, firstly, the zoning. Um, do you feel that this type of development is supported by Greenbelt policy, NE2? Uh, in terms of design quality, do you feel this is of uh, sufficient design quality and meets the, meets the requirements of policy D1? Uh, having regard for factors such as scale, siting, footprint, proportions relative to the original building, that sort of thing. Um, does the proposal satisfy the requirements of policy NE2? Um, that's Greenbelt as regards the development being of the highest quality in terms of siting, design, scale, etc. Um, and then following on from that, does it accord with the general principles we uh, just went over in the Householder Development Guide, specifically as regards extensions and outbuildings. And then uh, in terms of trees and arboricultural impact, is the proposal consistent with policy NE5's requirements for the protection of existing trees, including allowing for future growth? And lastly, in terms of green space network, would the proposal destroy or erode the character or function of the, the wider green space network? So ultimately coming to a conclusion on whether members feel this would comply with the development plan in the round. And uh, over and above the development plan, are there any other material considerations in this case that would weigh either for or against approval of the application? I'm happy to take any questions, although um, I suspect Mr Broch might be able to field some of the more technical ones on the arboricultural side um, and happy to, to advise on any other matters as you, as you wish. Thank you, Convener. Thanks very much, Mr Evans. Um, Councillor Bell, have you any questions for either Mr Evans or Mr Broch? Uh, yes, I, I do have one actually, um, and it's for Mr Broch. Um, no, sorry, first of all for, for Mr Evans. So last time we, 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 we met, um, the um, the root protection area was going to have um, uh, some uh, matrix uh, grid applied um, in the construction zone, and um, it appeared that that was going to be removed after after construction. Can you clarify that if that is still the case, please? Uh, yes, that's my understanding, Councillor Bell. Um, the tree survey submitted by the applicants refers to the cellular confinement system, the sort of matting that would be put down around uh, the, the footprint of the new extension and uh, and garage being removed after the, the completion of construction works. Right, uh, so can I ask Mr Brock, is that what you would recommend? The um, cellular confinement, uh, good afternoon by the way, the Thank cellular you. confinement system can either be uh, retained and used um, for a patio or a path um, uh, uh, or it can be removed. Um, it doesn't really make any difference to, to the trees or the roots. Okay, can, can, I, can I please ask you, are you familiar with BS 5837-2012? Yes, I am, yeah. And uh, can I refer you to subsection 6.2.1.3, please? Can I read it to you? Yeah. The protected area should be regarded as sacrosanct, and once installed, barriers and ground protection should not be removed or altered without prior recommendation by the project arboriculturist and, where necessary, approval from the local planning authority. So I'm guessing you're a project um, arboriculturist, so your recommendation is it can be removed. Uh, yes, it could be removed. Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. I mean, it would only need to remain in place during construction. Okay, so so BS five eight three seven twenty four and its forerunner BS five three eight seven two thousand and five are still open to interpretation. Obviously, I'm sorry. I'm just reading the British standard. <laughs> Yes, OK, I, I've got that open now. So are you looking at the latest version 2012? Yeah, uh, subsection 6.2.1.3. Yeah, that's. Um, 
page 19. Page 19. Okay, the protected area should be regarded as sacrosanct and once installed, barriers and crown protection should not be removed or altered without prior. Yeah, that's in relation to the duration of the um, the construction. Not uh, beyond construction. Really? Is that what that means? Yeah, yeah, that's what that means, yeah. This is a problem, Richard, with having an engineer here. <laughs> but I, but I, I'm just reading this and it says once installed, barriers and ground protection should not be removed or altered without prior recommendation. Yeah, well, so uh, that's, that's that's to ensure that the trees and the roots are protected during the construction period. That's what that means. OK, so um, so so of course, um, so so tree roots are primarily in the top 30 centimetres of, of the soil, aren't they? And uh, and because uh, further down oxygen becomes more limiting um you know you, you you protect the you protect that area don't you so so are you are you quite happy that um with this this protection system removed uh, there is absolutely no problem with the, with the tree growing tree the, the roots advancing toward the building that will cause no damage to the, the building no damage to the tree not a problem well uh, the tree roots um, could cause damage to the existing house or the existing garage. Uh, uh, the trees are close enough for that to occur, but yeah. that tends to occur much more on clay soils. Um, and I doubt very much if this is a clay soil here, we tend to not suffer from subsidence in this part of the world. Um, Tree, tree roots uh, will um, generally grow uh, where it's easiest for them to access um, uh, moisture um, and um, they don't like anaerobic conditions, um, you know, where soil has been compacted um, uh, beneath a house or beneath a, an extension to a house. Um, <clears throat> given the distance um, of the um, the the the, uh, the 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 trees from the, the the proposed extension, the outer edges of both extensions. I think it's unlikely that you're going to get uh, large roots that would cause damage uh, to 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 either extensions. Um, the tree survey <coughs> points out that um, uh, although there is some tree uh, some minor root loss. Um, less than 5% um, of the root protection area regarding the extension of the house <clears throat> and uh, less than 2% regarding the extension of the garage for the carport and the gym. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the trees are quite likely to um, establish roots elsewhere, new roots, um, elsewhere within that root protection area where they would be expected to uh, have roots. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, I, I, um, Mr. Groff, you saved me asking you questions. Right? Uh, you've just actually answered my questions in your little spiel there, so that was really helpful. Thank you very much, actually. It's very reassuring what you've just said to us. And Sir Mackenzie, have you got any questions? No, I had concerns about the trees as well, but Mr. Brofs answered my concerns. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brofs. You're welcome. Thank um, you. Any further questions, members? No? OK, um, so are we quite content then we can go on to determine the application? And we've had our questions answered. Perhaps I'll I'll kick off. Um, you know, I think it's been really helpful hearing um, from Mr. Broth today. It certainly has given me reassurance. I think uh, we have to be uh, mindful, obviously, when there's trees involved. However, I think if we look around the city, there is many, many trees, and I think in this particular area, there's there's a large group of trees that are not within the the um, cartilage of the, the house. Um, 
if we look at the different policies that Mr. Evans went through, um, I don't think any one um, or any two really, uh, I don't, and any one which is the green space, I don't think this extension would have a negative impact. Uh, and the same goes for any two. And the reason being is we're not intensifying, uh, and I think Mr. Evans alluded to this by adding ex houses or extra people. What we're doing is we're, we're perhaps extending a footprint on an established building. So for me, I don't have concerns along those lines. Um, again, I don't think, I mean, when we look at any five, it's about minimizing where possible any adverse impact on the trees. And I think with the root protection um, measures that have been put in during the build, um, I'm satisfied with the comments actually from Mr. Roth today that any minor infri infringement into the roots will not impact negatively on the health of these trees. I think, as I say, you know, we've all got views, I think, on um, the, the, the problem, but, you know, I think these are pretty substantial trees and um, I, I, I don't feel that this extension would impact and make that we're often asked about well when the tree grows but I think if we look at it from that there's an awful lot of houses that will be impacted by many trees in the city and we could be seeing the whole city stripped and I think most people live with the trees and actually enjoy the trees as part of the backdrop so for me I'm content that you know any five that the mitigation has been put in place um, and that future security of these trees will be maintained Design quality, I think it matches, you know, D1, it matches in with what is there. Um, so for me, I might not have chosen to design it the way it was to start with, but, you know, for what's there, single story, um, I think it's reasonably neutral. And then I think majorly different, moving away from the existing dwelling would have perhaps made it stand out um, for the wrong reason. So I'm content that D1 is compliant. We've heard about supplementary guidance on extension and outbuildings. And again, I think in general terms, and in fact, the office itself has any of that. So, you know, the main item it came down to was obviously any five, which was, was the trees. Um, you know, we heard there's obviously with any eight, there was been a back survey, and again, there was no conflict um, suggested there. So it really does boil down to whether we feel that the impact on the trees will be to such an extent that uh, we should refuse the application and uphold the officer's recommendation. In this case, I'm content that actually we will, I would suggest we overturn the officer's recommendation um, and allow this extension. And I'd ask Mr. Evans, uh, once we have a decision by all of us, um, for any um, conditions that he feels might be um, appropriate. Can I ask uh, Councillor McKenzie? Yes, I agree with what she Sorry, you broke up there, Councillor McKenzie. Do you want to just repeat that? Sorry, I agree. I, I agree with what you've been saying. Okay. Councillor Bell? Uh, uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, my, so my one... Um, my one reservation was with um, policy NE5, and uh, um, Mr. Brock has actually um, given me reassurance as the expert arboriculturalist um, compared to um, the, the recommendations of BS5837-2012, and actually there isn't a problem. I, I have absolutely no objection. Mr. Evans, um, would there be any recommend uh, conditions that you'd recommend that we would attach to an approval of this application? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, normally for house extensions or the like, um, we sometimes would apply a condition um, relating to uh, agreement of details of materials and things. Although in this case, I think we saw from the drawings that it had been specified, you know, to a fairly uh, high standard that we know exactly what's happening, so that that might not be necessary in this case. Other than that, uh, the only things that would occur would just be a condition, a condition or conditions to require um, implementation of the work uh, per the the sort of method statement that's included in the tree survey, and also the the implementation of the tree protection measures that are that are set out within that, including the the geotextile sort of grid and the tree protection fencing. 
Thank you, that would be helpful. So with um, those, those recommended conditions around inspection, et cetera, can we agree that we will um, overturn the officer's recommendation and approve the application? Agreed? Agreed, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Masson, do you need anything further from us? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Broth, for attending today. As I say, that was really helpful. And thank you, Mr. Evans, for, for again, taking us through the uh, the appeal. And I see we've got our, our legal advisor, Karen, there as well. So thank you all for attending today. And that concludes the um, hearing of the LRB today. Thank you.